Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'll give it another minute or so just to allow everyone to join on before we get started. Okay. Well, go over, go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Critical Path Institute's Rare and Orphan Diseases Program. My name is Dominique Cruz. I'm a project manager for the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data and Analytics Platform, or RDSA-DAP for short. RDSA-DAP provides a centralized and standardized infrastructure to support and accelerate rare disease characterization with the overall goal of accelerating the therapy development for rare diseases. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone today to today's webinar, Improving Data Collection for Rare Epilepsies, a case example from the TSC Natural History Database. Before we begin our presentation, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions throughout the presentation um, or at the Q&A panel at the end, please put them in the Q&A chat box. The chat function is disabled just so that we can make sure we aren't missing anyone's questions that pop up and all participant lines are muted so that we can reduce background noise during the presentation. We are recording this presentation and it will be made available shortly after on the CPATH YouTube channel. Um, and I, we've also included our contact information if there are any questions um, that come up that we aren't able to answer during um, this webinar. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for today. Elizabeth Cassidy is the research project manager at the T TSC Alliance and supports various research projects in the organization. Um, in particular, the TSC Natural History Database and Biosample Repository. She earned her Master of Public Health degree from George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health in 2022. Liz, thanks for joining us today and I'll hand it off to you. Great. Um, give me one second to share my screen. All right. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Great. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dominique, for the introduction. My name is Liz Cassidy, and it's such a pleasure to speak with you all today at the RDCA DAP webinar series. Um, I know today's webinar is focused on improving data collection for rare epilepsies and rare diseases, and I'm hoping that I can show that the database that we use at the TSC Alliance, the TSC Natural History Database that I help oversee, um, can be an example of a database that has grown into being a large resource for researchers um, in the rare disease space. Um, and how we've been able to launch different projects through its improvements throughout the years. Um, firstly, just some background on the TSC Alliance and who we are. Um, the TSC Alliance was founded in 1974, so we're actually hitting our 50 year anniversary this year. Um, and we're an internationally recognized nonprofit that does everything it takes to improve the lives of people living with tuberous sclerosis complex or TSC. Um, we work in developing programs, um, support services, and resource information for our TSE community. Um, we fund and drive research through different research initiatives and providing research grants. Um, and we create um, and implement public and professional education programs designed to heighten the awareness of the disease. Um, for some background, for those of you who may not be as familiar with TSC, so TSC is a genetic disorder that causes non-cancerous or benign tumors to grow in almost every major organ of the body. That includes skin, kidneys, brain, hearts, heart, eyes, and lungs, and more. And you can see some examples of these manifestations on the graphic here. Um, TSC can initially be clinically diagnosed due to the involvement in one or more of these organs, um, but it can also be genetically diagnosed or can confirm diagnosis through genetic sequencing for a disease-causing mutation in the TSC1, TSC2 gene. Um, TSC is estimated to affect one in every 6,000 live births. So while it's not ultra rare, it is still what we call and consider a rare disease, um, with nearly 1 million people worldwide affected with TSC, and even in the U.S. alone, about 50,000 people diagnosed with TSC. Um, we found that there really is no gender or racial bias on the prevalence of TSC, um, and that it can actually affect every individual differently. So the severity of TSC can range from an individual being profoundly impacted in their quality of life and daily living, 
while some people less so, even um, where we found even people within the same family of being diagnosed with TSC. Um, for example, one individual with TSC may experience um, impactful generalized seizures daily, multiple times a day, really needing to adhere to their medication and needing rescue medications, um, while other may not, others may not experience um, seizures at all. Um, seizures do remain one of the more common features of TSC, though, so we estimate about 85% of those um, with TSC will experience seizures. Um, some other common manifestations, including um, TSC-associated neuropsychiatric disorders, or TAND, um, and that's really our umbrella term that we use for behavioral manifestations like autism spectrum disorder, aggression, anxiety, and depression, um, which we found can affect approximately 45% of people with TSC. And then also our kidney manifestations that we see, which occur as angiomyolympomas, affecting about 70% of adults with TSC. Um, TSC is what we consider a linchpin disease. Um, meeting its genetic pathway is similar um, to other more common diseases and disorders like cancer, epilepsy, diabetes, autism. So we really feel that advancements and investments in TSC research can benefit the understanding of things that affect the broader population and may actually lead to a better understanding in these diseases that affect millions of people worldwide. So one of the several research initiatives that we have going on at the TSC Alliance is the TSC Natural History Database and Biosample Repository. The database was initiated in 2006 from a federally funded research grant awarded to a TSC clinician in Texas in collaboration with the TSC Alliance. And its main focus is really to capture the natural history of an individual with TSC over time through clinical information in the medical record being updated annually with those database variables. Um, the database started back then with five small clinics entering data, and we now have 20 clinics from across the country and even two in Canada, as well as the TSC Alliance serving as a site um, where we are the sponsors and main oversight of the project, um, with over 2,600 individuals enrolled now. So the Natural History Database really is a resource where we house that clinical information about TSC, including those manifestations that I mentioned. Um, that affects people with TSC, and we're now able to tie the clinical information to what we call a biosample in our biosample repository. So the biosample collection portion of this project started in 2016, um, where we try to collect an annual blood sample from individuals with TSC, as well as the opportunity to, for them to provide an optional cheek swab or leftover historical tissue from a previous surgery a patient enrolled um, in the project um, that they've had. Um, so we started collecting samples in 2016, and now we have over 2,600 samples in our biobank. Um, so the database itself is housed within study tracks, um, and they're a uh, data management software that special specializes in electronic data captures for clinical trials, surveys, and patient registries like our database. Um, so this slide uh, just summarizes how we've grown um, our biosample repository, but as someone that works in this project day to day, the growth of our biobank really does speak to the overall growth of our natural history database as well. So with us having grown to over 2,600 samples in our biobank, we've had an increased need for our, our researchers who are using these samples to understand the clinical associations of these samples that they're utilizing for an analysis. So we've expanded on the variables of our database that are commonly analyzed along our blood, uh, on our blood that is spun down into plasma for biomarker analysis, for example. So um, the DNA as well, that can be isolated from blood alongside any sequencing data that we can provide in the database. So in particular, kind of touching on that, the genetic section in our natural history database is a great example on a section where we've really grown since it's first started. Um, it's one of the most highly requested data sets um, from the natural history database that is requested by our researchers. So really working in tandem with genetic experts in TSC and outside of TSC, um, genetic counselors and researchers that make sure we are capturing the best data possible on what might be the most optimal for projects like these. Um, and of course, one of the most important reasons why we are collecting and growing data is so we can share this data that is captured on the TSC Natural History Database to researchers. Um, we strive in making data accessible and known to the research community so we can generate a better understanding on how to monitor and treat TSC. 
Um, so who receives data? Um, really any qualified researcher from anywhere in the world who submits a data access application um, that can be found in our website or by reaching out to me via email, happy to provide that out. Um, and so that is completed by them via email and they have their IRB approval letter ready. Um, so while of course um, the Natural History Database and Biosample Repository, we have our own IRB approval, we want to ensure pa patient privacy and do our due diligence that the ethics of the research being done is sound and they have their own institutional approval. Um, so they submit their IRB approval letter alongside our data access application, which is completed. Um, and that data access application really is just the one pager that's asking the requester, what is the research question? What are their desired outcomes? And what variables do you need? Um, so the application is reviewed by the TSC Alliance staff, um, and then it's reviewed and passed to our Natural History Database Steering Committee for approval. And our steering committee is actually made up of TSC research experts and providers to ensure that the research is applicable and innovative to TSC. So they let us know at the TSC Alliance if they approve the request. And so once it's approved, we provide the de-identified data to the researcher containing the variables um, they requested that's exported from our database. Um, we're able to export in various file formats to fit the statistical needs of a researcher. So um, usually it's in Excel, but we can export in CSV and other formats. Um, and we're also always available for data walkthroughs and inquiries and questions about any data you might receive. Um, just some examples on how our data and samples have been used. So we have had over 21 publications to date published from researchers utilizing our data in highly regarded peer-reviewed journal art articles. And we've distributed over two portions of over 2,000 samples to 47 distinct researchers for 56 distinct projects all over the world. So from Asia to Europe um, to here within the U.S., um, and this pie chart on the left goes into a bit more detail about the types of samples we've distributed from our value bank. And in many of these cases um, where samples are distributed, we are providing that associated clinical data from the natural history database. Um, for example, if we're distributing sa samples related to angiomyelopoma biomarkers due to kidney tissue or biomarkers in the blood, um, usually when requested, we also provide the clinical information on the kidney variables for the samples and the patients that they are being analyzed. So the researcher can really take that next step in the understanding of clinical history and what other factors may be influencing certain things in a biomarker analysis. Um, we've had over 142 requests to date, which have contributed to all aspects of research from industry to academia. We've contributed to clinical trials as well. Um, as well as our own internal projects that we do at the TSC Alliance as for um, our own quality improvement initiatives and for our TAND initiative project, which I will go into in a bit in a minute. Um, as we've grown as a database and just generally in the way that the research community and the way that people are collecting clinical information is better understood, we've also implemented other projects within our natural history database that help us capture really the broader picture of the experience of living with TSC, um, particularly within these two projects and collaborations here where we're trying to collect those patient reported outcomes. So we implemented our self-report portal in 2019, and this project has really allowed us to start collecting what we call patient report outcomes or PROs. Um, as many of us that are involved in data curation and collection and probably familiar with, um, PROs really allow for us to gather that individual perspective um, and experience um, what it's like living with TSC from directly that in, from directly from that individual um, with a certain manifestation and what they experience in TAND or what they experience going to the clinic directly from them. And in the case of individuals um, with TSC who may be unable to report for themselves, um, PROs can also be answered directly in the self-report portal by a patient uh, from a parent or caregiver, um, which we also call a caregiver reported outcome. Um, and gathering this data really helps us not only to better understand the perspective of those living with TSC directly from them, but we can also begin to track changes and measure improvements in areas that are more important in our community in the context of general care, treatment, quality of life, quality of life, and other risk benefit measures. 
Um, so right now we do have an ongoing project which we are doing in collaboration with the international group called the Tandem Consortium. And that group really is focusing on the manifestations under the tandem umbrella that I previously mentioned, or those behavioral manifestations like autism and anxiety to see if we can help them validate the PRO called the TAN-SQ or the TAN Self-Quantified Checklist. And like I mentioned earlier in the self-report portal, that is built within our natural history database. So our same participants that consent to be part of the natural history database and biosample repository can also consent to connecting their clinical data in the database to their self-reported data in the self-report portal with their existing records. So we currently have 108 individuals enrolled in the self-report portal who have answered surveys um, with a good majority of those also being enrolled in the database. Although I should note on that, that participants do not have to be enrolled in the database to complete our PROs in the portal. And we're looking to add other PROs in the future, um, kind of looking at maybe race, racial and ethnic diversity, um, looking at clinical diversity, things like that in the future. And another dating sharing initiative that we have tied to our clinical data in the database is with seizure trackers. So we started a data share system with them in 2020. Um, and seizure tracker is a web-based platform which really allows anyone who experiences epilepsy to log their diary seizure activity, as well as um, other impactful medical data that go along with their epilepsy diagnosis, such as any medications or when rescue medications are taken, um, surgeries and different events and more that it was really accessible right in the palm of their hands. So similarly to consenting to the self-report portal, those who consent to the natural history database are um, and are participating or interested in participating in seizure tracker, they may not have heard of seizure tracker before and hear it from when they're going through consenting and ask if they would like to participate and they are interested. Um, they can elect to sharing their seizure diary information with the natural history database record for use for TSE researchers. And um, actually we were able to present a poster on seizure tracker information um, with data sharing to the NHD um, in association with TAN manifestations that are reported in the natural history database at this past year's American Epilepsy Society. And that um, project really just highlights that these collaborations can contribute to a better well-rounded data set that can lead to new discoveries in TSC and epilepsy and more. Um, and in 2022, we also began our TAND initiative, which you heard me talk a little bit about and kind of talking about the TAND umbrella, um, which really focuses on the gaps that we have in our understanding of TSC-associated neuropsychiatric disorders, um, particularly in patient care and therapy development. So again, TAN is really our umbrella term that we use that really encapsulates the behavioral and psychological manifestations of TSC including autism, anxiety, intellectual and learning disabilities, and more. And really this initiative launched because of our response from the community voice. Um, we're in a constituent survey in 2018. We found that TAN was being reported as being one of the most impactful and burdensome symptoms of daily living with TSC. Um, and after receiving a generous donation and dedication for this initiative, we started what we call the Anya's Accelerator Program at the TSC Alliance. Um, so for this project, we will be analyzing blood-based biomarkers in individuals living with TAND and looking at developing better PRO measures for TAM symptoms that help us address earlier diagnosis, stratification and severity, um, earlier prognosis, and how different individuals with TAND respond to treatment. In particular, last spring, we held our first TAN biomarker innovative workshop, and actually Alex from the RDC ADAPT team actually attended, and um, we had not only TSC experts attend, but also experts in psychology, biomarkers, and data curation all came together to discuss not only how do we collect and develop this biomarker data, um, but how do we determine how the data is accessible to wider research community once we have that. So in continuation with our goal to disseminate our NHD data, we also want to disseminate that this data that is curated in this project with researchers, we can find a platform that allows for analysis for the understanding of the disease mechanism of TAND. So our biomarker analysis plan is currently underway. Um, we've currently um, have received some results back from the data that we have began to analyze and really our next steps that are that we are now starting from growing our samples and that are starting to be analyzed 
identifying which PROs are being utilized in our TSC community already so we can have a better understanding for that portion of the project and developing on those PROs that do exist. And how can we associate the identification of these PROs to our discovery of biomarkers? So really bringing those two portions of the projects together. And as well as utilizing our existing natural history database resource to contribute to this project. So really this project is an example of how we're continuously making changes on bettering our database as Prior to this, we really didn't feel like we had to capture behavioral measures and neuropsych assessments. Alex will know that I talked a little bit about at the um, innovative workshop that previously in the natural history database, we captured this diagnostic phenotypic information as, do you have an autism diagnosis? Yes, no. Um, and now we're trying to make the changes so we can contribute better to these associations and have a better idea of what those scores are and the phenotypic information to contribute to the associations of disease severity to these TAN biomarkers. And so, like I said, we're currently making these variable adjustments to better capture those me measures and have a greater TAN data set and asset. So the TSC Natural History Database is really an ongoing and growing project, but it truly has become one of the largest resources for TSC researchers to utilize data for a variety of different projects involving biomarkers and drug therapies and our understanding of these manifestations. So we're continuously growing um, from our data sharing opportunities, like being involved in PROs and the work that our researchers are doing. Um, and we continue to accelerate research, um, making our data accessible. We also fund annual natural history database and biosample repository seed grants every winter, where we award up to $20,000 in funding to researchers looking to utilize our database resources. So how are some of the ways that we are continuously growing our database resource? Comes from several different angles, from hearing from the researchers directly that are using the data, but also hearing directly from our community. Um, and as I mentioned before, our steering committee that helps approve these requests that come through for data through that data access application form. The steering committee also provides guidance on potential variables, that variable changes and adjustments that we may wanna make in our natural history database and those um, data points. So for example, we held a meeting at the end of last year with our steering committee to review potential changes um, that align with our quality improvement project and reproductive and perinatal health at the TSC Alliance, um, where we're looking to capture data on women's health um, for looking at the experience of women living with TSC and the TSC experience as well in the perinatal period for just a better understanding of these manifestations in utero and at the newborn stage. So making those changes based off um, what we're hearing within internally and what researchers are also looking to um, analyze. And we have ongoing meetings with members of our steering committee throughout the year to ensure we're clearly defining these variables that we want to change or add, also involving experts, and to make sure that it's relevant to something that is actually captured in the medical record. And we also want to make adjustments based to what our community wants us to focus on. So I know that I mentioned that our TAN initiative kind of stemmed from the community voice telling us that TAN is something that affects their day to day. And now we are making variable changes, kind of like I mentioned, to better support that project for better, um, more spe specific um, phenotypic data to better capture those behavioral measures. Um, we hold TSC research conferences every two years, um, hosted by the TSC Alliance. And this past year, we held a session on big databases where big data and data sharing, um, finding kind of finding out how it's heading into the future. And we discussed um, challenges of um, how do we clearly and consistently define data fields and data cleaning for data sets related to TSC. Um, how can we sustain that moving forward into the future? How do we continue to make them available as technology starts to change? And finally, we have contributed to the RDCA DAP platform, and we received feedback um, via feedback assessment form, and we did share data with them on initial review on the registry data we've contributed. Um, whereas we know we're looking to, um, they are looking to provide feedback for the purpose of improving data sharing efforts. 
So a couple of years ago, we did contribute to the CPATH platform and their view, vision really does align with our vision that it's critical to share rare disease data to help advance new drug development from our communities. And we shared data to CPATH and RDC ADAP team. Um, we worked with them to help curate and standardize some of our data points in order to maximize its value and maximize our database's value. And once that was done, they sent us back a standardized data, um, data set so we could evaluate um, the work performed. Um, they also shared the feedback report, which I mentioned, which contains some recommendations to help us better improve our own data collection, which I'll go into in a little in the slide, in the next slide. Um, and our data set is visible and requestable on the RDCA DAP platform. Um, so scientists can develop projects and leverage their data for their own activities. And we continue to make changes to our database. We continue to look forward to working with them on how we can continue to make it the best it can be and accessible to our research community. And I just want to end on some examples where working with CPATH and the feedback assessment has really made an impact on our natural history database and really looking forward to um, continuing to get those from the team. And these recommendations did come from our feedback assessment, and I'm happy to expand on any of these as well as the rest of the team feel to jump in on the call, but I decided to mention these three because I feel like they really do speak to how we can curate data sets to being more consistent and reliable. So firstly, CPATH recommended the development of a data dictionary. And before this, we, we did have sort of a list where our variables are shown and how they are identified within our software study tracks. Um, but we really didn't have um, it defined and structured based on the recommendations that CPATH provided. So they really show great examples of how a data dictionary should be shown utilizing their format. Um, and I really recommend this, particularly when you're first building a database or making variable changes um, when you're communicating with the people that manage the software and are building the software. Um, so the communication between what you're trying to capture is um, being relayed appropriately to your database development team. Um, and so you're capturing data accurately at the time of data entry. So we made some great adjustment, adjustments to that and now it really aligns to the format that they provided. Um, CPATH did make a point about clinical outcome assessments, and you heard me talk a lot about PROs on the webinar today, but um, the feedback on this from CPATH did help us develop our self-report portal surveys that we now have, and which I touched on previously, and it's become a focus on the TAND initiative in particular. Um, and because of this, we're also working on capturing better behavioral assessments within our database, kind of like I mentioned that we're making those database changes to capture that more specific phenotype scalable data um, and to capture those variables more effectively. So we're currently working on that um, and we're working on variable changes included in this year. And finally, CPATH did catch in our data exports that dates were being converted into years. And they did tell us that this really doesn't help someone distinguish data that's receiving these data time points. Um, and distinguish these time points in order of timing. So they told us that making these age time points more granular would help one understand age better and when things are happening through the lifespan. So we since then have made the adjust adjustment of our age conversion to be exported in days of age rather than um, years of age to capture that specificity. Um, so that is um, where I end, but um, I know we'll be moving on to the Q&A portion. And wanted to say thank you again to the RDCA DAP team allowing me to come and speak to you all about the TSC Natural History Database and some of our many projects and collaborations. And um, as we continue to move forward to making database improvements, I'm continuing to look forward with our partnership with CPATH sharing data on CPATH and how we can optimize and share our data in the future. Um, looking forward to answering all of your questions. And um, if any questions come up after the webinar, please feel free to reach out to me as well via email. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Liz. That, that was a great presentation. Um, so we are now going into our panel discussion. Uh, I want to remind our audience that you can ask a question to uh, Liz and our panelists. So please insert your question in the chat box and we take uh, try to take as many questions as you will, as you have. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, the rest of our panel today. Uh, ID Graben Stader is scientific director for the RDC ADAPT team uh, and a specialist in uh, rare epilepsies. 
and Nicole Vasilevsky, Associate Director for uh, of Data Science for Data Collaboration Center, uh, who also has a great body of knowledge uh, in the space and in data in general. Uh, Liz, just starting before um, we go uh, into the panel discussion, uh, you know, to see just a comment from my end. I think two things were very strike striking from. Uh, what you presented, it's further ra rapid and continuous growth of your data collection efforts. It's really impressive how much you built from when I joined, what I, what I knew about, you know, from TSC when I joined CPATH and, and where you are right now. And I think the second piece is the very participative nature of your group. Uh, I witnessed that firsthand, as you mentioned, at one of your meeting uh, last year with many different stakeholders at the table, all working together to try to move things forward for, for the disease. Uh, also, as you mentioned, you know, your data sharing. It's not just RDC adapts. There is a greater nature in, in the uh, greater number of data sharing initiatives that you have. Uh, and, and it's really great to see that. And again, TSC was really one of the first, if not the first uh, foundation to share uh, data to the RDC adapt platform. Uh, maybe just a, a quick uh, question before ID takes over, ID and Nicole take over. Um, you mentioned on the first slide uh, how TSC may help other uh, rare disease or other disease. And that kind of struck me because that's, as you know, that's part of the RDC, that vision, trying to aggregate rare disease data without a specific disease in mind with a long-term vision of opening cross disease discovery. So I'm just wondering if you could comment a bit more on that or if you had you know, an, an example on what disease could TSC potentially help, especially a rare disease or vice versa, what TSC will need in terms of information that could be leveraged for, from other rare disease that at this moment in time would be very helpful for your research activities. Yeah, so kind of as you touched on with our TAND in, uh, our TANS innovative project. Um, so we are looking and um, collaborating really closely with autism experts and kind of, I touched a little bit on how autism um, is very similar in the genetic pathway and TSC can be one of the leading causes, causes of autism. Um, so we're turning to um, autism experts to better understand what biomarkers are already out there and um, talking to autism experts that may have already discovered some biomarkers and inflammation and keeping them involved in um, our steering committee that is working on the Anya's Accelerator Program for Biomarker Analysis. So um, that's a little bit of an example. Um, we also have a lot of researchers that are looking into the association of um, kidney manifestations that maybe non-TSC associated, so renal cell carcinoma, things like that, that um, do occur in TSC, but um, may occur differently in people that have um, renal cancer outside of TSC space. So looking at those biomarker associations as well. Um, and um, kind of going back to uh, maybe under the TAND umbrella, um, we have researchers also looking at um, how TSC might be associated with um, Alzheimer's and dementia, um, so again, those diseases that um, cause that maybe more affect the more common population. Um, so learning from different spaces that we can all bring it together in our understanding of TSC and learning, putting those together to um, collaborate with those researchers that are looking at those specific other diseases as well. Great, awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Ideal, or oh, Nicole, do you want to uh, make a co comment on that or just, you know, change subject and take it from there. Yeah, no, this is really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm very curious about, um, you mentioned that you want to look at um, different biomarkers and such. So with the RDC ADAP, we want to enable data discovery of other data sets, including data sets that are relevant to the TSC community. Um, mm -hmm. So what are some of the key variables that if you were searching the RDC ADAP as a, or, or, or if TS, TSC researchers were searching the RDCA DAP, what would be some of the key variables that they would want to search on when looking for relevant data? So it sounds like biomarker information also sounds like maybe age-related progression or phenotypic mm -hmm. presentation, kind of the temporality aspect, maybe information that they'd want to receive. Um, we're really wondering about how to best uh, present the data that we have and, and, and standardize the data to make it the most searchable and being able to search on the variables that people are interested in. Yeah, and that's sure. Yeah, and that's something that we are looking at too while we are making these changes for 
that phenotypic data in autism and anxiety. And um, while we're continuing to make those discoveries and developments on PROs, um, kind of figuring out um, what would be the best way for us to capture that. Um, and where we're going to start really is capturing um, the scalable measures. So things like um, PROs that are already, that may be already captured in the clinic and what those results are, the percentiles are um, in our natural history database. So um, starting with those variables, um, we're going to pilot those and see what our clinics are saying, um, the clinics that are doing data entry for us and seeing what they think. Um, we also work really closely with the um, rare disease clinical network team and making sure that um, they, we're also um, aligning with things that they um, also believe may be important for us to capture. So um, yeah, I think it's just really kind of a testing right now of what we're trying to see for PROs and those variables. But yeah, I think it's a work in progress. And have you all worked with any data standards or do you implement any standards in your data collection? Like, uh, like for the RDC ADAP, we standardized a lot of the data to OMOP or to um, biomedical ontologies, like the human phenotype ontology. Um, have you, are you familiar with those or are you keeping those in I'm, mind? Yeah. I'm not, but I we do follow some standard um, NIH data collection and things like that. Um, but yeah, I can look into that and get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to work with you on that. If, if we yeah, that. that'd be great. Yeah. Elizabeth, if I may, I'm, I'm I'm fascinated by the progress that you've made with TAN and um, the little that I've, I I understand about it. There, there's multiple levels of of neuropsychological disorders mm -hmm. that kind of depend on uh, that span across the lifespan and depend upon the TSC manifest manifestations that the patient is um, impacted by. Uh, you mentioned in the feedback report that there was some advice given about uh, the age in, in days versus the age in, in, um, in years. And mm -hmm. the fact that your infrastructure allows you to connect the data that you're collecting on the neuropsychological disorders uh, clinically and also with your uh, patient reported outcomes. Mm -hmm. Have you gained any insights on what might be triggering some of these different neuropsychological disorders um, now that you have uh, introduced it, more granularity to your data set? Yeah, not yet. Um, we're hoping that we can find some associations that can speak to um, early diagnostic and really tackling that early diagnostic journey and seeing if we're able to put in those um, assessments at an earlier age and seeing what we find when we do start to collect those in our database, um, seeing how that impacts quality of life. And um, as we continue to collect data on an individual over time, seeing if that impacts their manifestations of TANS later on in the future. Um, so we really feel that'll be impactful when we do get to that point. Um, at the moment, no, but we are hoping that that is something that we can achieve um, given uh, making those adjustments. So, yeah. Thank you, Liz. Um, I have a related question. I mean, related to that data, data piece uh, about data dictionaries. Uh, and broadly, the question is about adaptability. Mm -hmm. uh, and standardization of the data dictionaries. And I guess it applies more broadly into defining the collections that you need to make of, of patients. So the question is about these overall, is there a standardized data dictionary? And then how can we go about it with a specific disease in mind? This is someone from the Syn SYNGAP1 uh, mm -hmm. Foundation or, or uh, ARIA asking that question and explaining that they have some specificities in terms of seizures and other manifestations that they have. And so... That's, that's the question. Yeah, so I think um, adapting, of course, to what you're hearing from your clinics, um, but of course, working with the data dictionary that you guys provided from CPATH, I think that was very helpful in making sure that we're capturing um, that information that's clearly defined. And kind of like I said, when you are when you have a data dictionary and you're providing that to people that are working on the development of your software, and then, of course, that'll be provided to um, people that are doing data entry, making sure that those variables are clearly defined. Um, and I'm sure that you guys can speak a little bit better than I can on um, how a data dictionary should be formatted, but just making sure that it's clear. Um, and I think for us, when we um, have been expanding on our understanding of epilepsy and how um, epilepsy has um, been more 
defined over time, um, we've been able to make those adjustments with having an easily understandable data dictionary and working with our clinicians on how they feel it should be identified. So, yeah. Great. Any, any other uh, comments you may want to make, uh, ID or Nicole, on, on that question? Yeah, just I definitely agree that having a standardized dictionary is very critical. And um, I like the idea of having a dictionary that's specific to specific subtypes of, of epilepsy. That would be very valuable to have. Yeah. Well, and there's a question, I think, from the audience that um, get some, some uh, rare epilepsies have uh, a syndromic uh, component to them. And uh, I think... To Elizabeth's point earlier, you know, she said how TSC can help inform other rare diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, Tracy Dixon Salazar from uh, the LGS Foundation asking whether anyone has um, looked at the data you were talking about in TSC patients who, or, you know, L LGS patients who have involved mm -hmm. into TSC. And is, is that a, uh, a possibility that, that, that they could um, look at that data. Um. Yeah, um, so Tracy, we do capture um, the possible comorbidities with LGS in our naturalist database. We have um, a comorbidity section in our database um, where we are capturing that. Um, I have done a recent data poll on LGS and we found that right now there are a handful of patients that right now have the comorbidity associated with TSC and LGS um, and happy to speak with you more on that. Um, and yeah, happy to talk to you a little bit more about data dictionary and sharing that with you as well. Thanks, I think there's a related question I, I can answer at least on the RDC DAP and another question from, from Tracy about um, the data dictionary being shareable. Uh, so for us on the RDC that platform, it's really important to, to uh, make these data dictionaries available to the users at the entry level, may, mean, meaning if you have a, cr a credential on the platform as a simple user to be able to navigate the data sets and then get access to the data dictionaries. And each time we get a new data set, we curate the data and we curate data dictionaries to really make sure people understand the endpoints content. So on, on our end, we do share the data dictionaries. You can download them. Um, I don't know about other collections there for Elizabeth, where we may, you may have uh, shareable da data dictionaries. I can sense knowing what you just presented that you, you probably share them too. Yeah. Um, uh, let's go maybe into some more. Uh, well, actually, there was a good question, I think, uh, on uh, industry and your current TA, T, 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 T activities. And the question is, how do, have you done any work with the industry to define a measure, a TND measure for clinical trials? So I think it's a complex thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So please, if you have some, some answer to that and idea, Nicole, same thing, feel free to comment. Yeah, so um, the TANISQ, because it's still being validated, um, and like I said, we're working on really defining that core outcome set of TAN measures, um, specifically looking at TAN um, to utilize in clinical trials in clinical care. Um, it's not commonly used, but we did have the TAN SQ being used on an ongoing clinical trial that is going on right now. So we're in the very early stages of industry being used um, kind of using those TAN measures in clinical trials and really excited about it. But um, we're hoping more in the future as we begin to discover um, what those TAN measure are, what those TAN measures are, and we begin to have a better understanding of it, um, that industry will also start to use them in their clinical trials. But yeah, um, excitingly, the TAN SQ is being used in a clinical trial, and um, we're going to wait and see what comes out of that. Yeah, if I could piggyback on that, I, I I think it's very admirable the the push by the TSC Alliance because uh, a lot of these behavioral and neuropsychological disorders are uh, under identified and 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 under treated and not talked about a lot. Uh, um, 
even amongst families, I think, and, and there's a stigma attached. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you noted, they are sometimes the most burdensome if you do the survey and to um, work with industry and uh, the collective to standardize them both for your condition, but also for other DEEs, because I, I don't think it's a problem just necessarily for TSC. I think it's uh, unique to TSC, the way it manifests. Mm -hmm. And so it'd be interesting, I think, to learn how it's being, you know, is, is it disease, it, the, for this point, it's disease specific, uh, but to learn how it could inform maybe measures for, for DEEs that will eventually be used in clinical trials as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree yeah. with the difficulty of coming from somewhat coming from the perspective of working in data standards, being able to standardize behavioral abnormalities and neuropsychological conditions is very difficult to do. Even with the measures that we do, it's sometimes it's hard to know how to interpret those. And a lot of the scales may not add up or be consistent across different measures either. So as you're developing the scales and the and the measurements, it'd be um, something to keep in mind that make sure that the kind of questions that are asked, the interpretation of the questions is very well documented and, and shared mm -hmm. with, with the clinicians and the researchers so they understand how to interpret the, the measurements as well. Yeah, and just kind of more specifically, as we're working on this project, we are making sure that we keep in mind that the way that people answer PROs can be very different depending on age. Um, so obviously a parent responding for a small child can be very different from an adult answering from themselves and making sure that we can make those adjustments in the core outcome set and how we understand how, um, that can change depending on age and, um, how, um, that can be different and just little things as well. Um, we're also going to be looking at the association to epilepsy and, um, severity of TSC and what that, how that might be different as well and affect responses to PROs. So yeah, definitely agree with that. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have two disease specific question. Uh, one is about the location of the population, uh, Agnes, or Agnes said, it's interesting that most centers and cases seem to be in the eastern part of the U.S. Uh, is there any specific reason for that? So there can be many reasons why that is the case. So we do have, um, obviously, what can be like access to care. And a lot of those TSC centers and clinics can be located on um higher income areas and in bigger cities. And of course, we've come to recognize that access to care in rural areas can be very difficult to come across. So um, we are trying to reach out to clinics in maybe rural areas and areas that don't have that access. Um, and because those TSC centers of excellences and those TSC clinics that do participate um, and have more of a TSC population or have um, more of that reputation for being a TSC center or a TSC center of excellence. Um, those are the ones that we right now have um, being participation, being participants of the TSC Natural History Database and Biosample Repository. Again, we do try and tackle that problem as the TSC Alliance is kind of a remote site. And um, we try to do as much outreach as possible to those that may not have access to a TSC center that is a biosample repository site through remote consenting and um, consenting them over the phone. And we also have an initiative that um, is um, mobile phlebotomy. So we are able to go into the participant's home and um, go in and collect that biosample directly from them. Um, that way we're getting that blood sample that's connected to their clinical data, which um, I help um, get that clinical data directly from them and with their institution. So all they really need to do is sign a medical record access form. And I work with them on getting the medical records and doing data entry. So we try and circumvent um, that as much as possible. We do want to make sure that we are um, having research accessible um, to people that may not be in um, the East Coast or on the West Coast where clinics may be located. Um, but yeah, of course, that's a bigger problem of health access. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, and another question coming from Crystal from the um, Milan Cidron Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to your bio uh, samples effort, 
Do you have a formal protocol for our biosamples are collected across your 20 sites? Mm -hmm. And can researchers uh, share back findings, for example, biomarkers uh, on specific samples or information yeah. from your database? Yeah, no, of course, and we welcome that. Um, we want to make sure that we're keeping up with anything um, that people are requesting from us and that um, you guys come back for presenting at our international research conference or sharing any publications that are made with us. Um, keeping up with that is what we really want. Um, but yeah, I think just importantly that um, we do have a protocol for um, our biosample collection process and um, happy to speak more on that with you face uh, more directly, but yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two questions left, so let's, let's uh, we have the time. So let's go to our final questions uh, and there's more come up. Uh, one is from Teresa. What are your criteria for reputable researchers requesting data? Um, yeah, so yeah. So we've had um, people working on their graduate degrees request data from us. We've had um, you know, more senior stage researchers requesting data. So really it has spanned from both sides of the spectrum. And as long as you're submitting a research application, research request application that um, is stating um, how you're benefiting TSC community, what your research question is, and um, what your desired outcomes are. Um, we are happy to look into that and um, put it through our steering committee, um, answer any questions you may have. Um, and yeah, so it really can range. Great. And from the RDC ADAP angle, when you share data to us, there are different governance mechanisms, but usually people choose to review. Uh, choose a review mechanism. When it goes to us, we have a data use committee and actually Steve from TSC Alliance is mm -hmm. one of uh, the member of the data use committee. So we request a scientific plan and on our end, it's really scientific merit of the application. Uh, do we feel there is a, a strong scientific proposal uh, in our evaluation that the data requested actually makes sense with regards mm -hmm. to the scientific plan that is proposed? Uh, so that's kind of how we, we evaluate with five different members um, getting back to our audience questions, uh, Catherine uh, from Syngap has additional questions. Um, are people doing whole, ex sorry, whole, exon or whole genome sequencing uh, and do you have such data in the repository? Yeah, so we actually have kind of a side project from our biosample repository, our whole genome sequencing project. So um, that project really stemmed from us really wanting to build on the genetic data that is in our natural history database. And like I mentioned during my presentation, that is one of the most highly requested, obviously because we are a rare genetic disease, that is one of the most highly requested data sets that we get come through our data access form. Um, and we have initiated our whole genome sequencing project where um, we send um, randomly selected samples in our biobank to um, get whole genome sequencing and then get clinically validated. And then from that, we are able to use the reports that we get back to put in for research in our natural history database. So we get those results back. Um, and we are also, um, what's very beneficial for me that I see um, is that we are able to provide those results back to families. So as we know that whole genome sequencing and genetic sequencing can be a journey to get for some families due to accessibility and financial reasons. So um, one of the ways that they can get that is through um, the project if they're randomly selected for the project. Um, and what's really beneficial is not only do we provide those um, results back from whole genome sequencing, but we also provide the opportunity for a complimentary genetic counseling session. Um, so not only through this project are we benefiting research, but we're also benefiting families. And that's something that has been really meaningful for me participating in this. Um, so yeah, that is part of that. And we are hoping to grow um, on the cohort that we have in our whole genome sequence. We've currently had 115 samples um, go through the project. So really hoping to grow and working on that. Um, and then, of course, making the data accessible once we have it. Um, so that'll be our next step. Thank you. Uh, questions keep on arriving, so I'm going to keep on asking. Yeah, <laughs> we have a question from... from we have a question from Emily on the seizure tracker or your partnership with seizure tracker. Do you have access to the raw data that your patients and caregivers enter into the platform? Yeah, we do. And whenever we want to look with it, I look at it. I work really closely with um, the 
director and founder of Seizure Tracker, Rob Moss, um, such as when I was doing my project for American Epilepsy Society, we are able to look at that raw data um, on the diary information, epilepsy information, any clinical information that might be in Seizure Tracker alongside with our NHD raw data. So yeah, we are able to work with that and I'm happy to connect to you with Rob Moss if that's something that you're interested in learning more about from Seizure Tracker. All right. And uh, that might be our final question today from the audience, uh, from KV, uh, from Syngap again. I wonder if questions could have sliders uh, for how appropriate is the question based on developmental stage. Also, for example, another slider example, how different is this from what you expected compared to the non-affected sibling and co or compared to the patient the previous month? Yeah. Basically, so I, a question about getting slides, sliders that could let direct the answers. Yeah. Or I'm kind of thinking of this in a data entry mind. I'm also yeah. thinking of maybe like pop-ups or a branching logic that we could also utilize. But that's that's a really good point. Yeah. And I was just thinking about that. Maybe I, that's why I did smiling. You know, mm -hmm. there's a question for us, like the big question, some of these, you know, questions and and collections you know there's a big question on how do we do we uh, create that and standardize it you know in, in the databases so um i don't know ideal nicole if you have a final question or final uh, comment you want to make this is really great work that you're doing it's really great to see that you're able to collect all this data especially via all these different mechanisms and i think this is going to be really valuable for aiding this this affected population and, and related uh, patients. Thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to continue working with you guys and sharing um, with CPATH and seeing what else, other feedback you guys might have for us in the future. So thank you guys as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And and the CSC Alliance is, is has always been leaders in multidisciplinary clinics and, and, and data collection and sharing with the community on on what they've learned and and uh, we appreciate you coming and sharing again with us. Of course, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. With that be, being said, thanks again, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, and thanks to our audience for joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, the links to the webinar will be uh, made available on YouTube uh, in a few days uh, after today. Thanks everyone. And uh, we'll see you uh, soon for another webinar under the Rare and Orphan Disease Program at CPATH. Thank you.